Hello, and welcome to Maximal Fire. I'm Alex. And I'm Johnny. And here today we're going to ask, has the Plasma Blast Gun finally met its match? So Johnny, we've uh, it's been a few weeks since we last got together again. Um, I think the, we unfortunately we recorded something a, a couple of weeks before Christmas, and uh, there were some terrible, terrible audio problems that we experienced. So we basically lost the entire episode, annoyingly. So here we are again. Anyway, it's New Year's Day today. Yeah. Um, new Year, New You, or is it New Year? Pretty much the same, Johnny. Pretty much the same. I'm a, I'm a little bit delicate today, so uh, we'll have it's to a bit delicate. we'll have to go easy. But, um, okay. Yeah. No. Happy New Year. Happy New Year to you as well. Um, needless to say, lots of things planned for 2024. I think it's going to be very exciting. Hopefully, lots of uh, Legion's content coming out of the channel. Um, but today, we thought there has been quite a lot of um, content recently about Legion's Imperialis, and the game has obviously now re- been released, but it's in a kind of sort of awkward stage, let's just say, where there's not really enough content which has been released to kind of properly play the game um there's there's also stocking issues um but we're also obviously still trying to find our feet with the game itself and and learn it properly and get some test games in and we want to make sure that when we bring you the content that it's not just kind of like off the cuff and it is like properly thought out and it comes from a place of tried and tested experience um so to speak as best as you can from maximal fire um, so we thought we would delve, 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 delve back into uh, the world of Titanicus, and interestingly enough, as well, we have finally got the new Warhound weapon. Um, what do you call them? Cards. Weapon cards. Cards. Yeah, yeah the weapon cards um, for Adeptus Titanicus. So these are the plastic weapons, the new plastic weapons, which were and are currently only available in the uh, Legion's Imperialis starter set. So we thought, what better way than to come back with an episode? We'll look at those weapons, we'll take them to pieces, and we'll ask the question that everybody is asking, has the Plasma Blast Gun finally met its match? Um, Or is it business as usual on the tournament scene? Um, And we thought we'd follow that up as well by um, rounding out kind of our... um, series of Legio deep dives with um, a, a deep dive on the, the Legio Tempestus. Reason for this, we released a law video last year, which delved into the all of the background behind Legio Tempestus, and we realized, oh, we've not actually done a deep dive on them yet. And it's one of my own Legios, so like it's quite a bit surprising because <laughs> I own them, I played them a lot, I've won tournaments with them, but yet, for some reason, I uh, we haven't yet delved into the details. So... Um, that is what we're going to do today. Hell yeah. I'm ready. You feel, how you feel? Is your body ready? My body is not, um, but my mind's there almost. Your mind's so. there. Okay. We'll, we'll All right. See. Okay. <laughs> Before we get into it, just a quick reminder, as always, please do leave us a like and subscribe on, um, I nearly said Facebook, but uh, yeah, sh- sure. Like the Facebook page, uh, on YouTube, we are closing in on the top ends of the, uh, or nearly at the 2k mark still a few hundred off would be great to kind of like hit 2024 running with a nice boost to our subscriber numbers um and if you're not already on the discord um we are nearly at 2k no sorry 1k members on discord as well so it's a highly active community and if you are looking for legions imperialis or adeptus titanicus chat or ideas or advice it's a perfect place to go so uh head on over to our discount all of that links in the description below um and last bit of admin, big Patreon shout outs to our latest members. Want to say a big thank you very much to Craig Dolan, Paul Tomlins, McFloss, Madman, Miles Cheverton, and Thomas Vavasour. <clears throat> Sorry, Vavasour. Um, thank you very much, guys. Obviously, we can't do this without you. Um, shall we jump straight in? I think we should. I think, uh, yeah, we're ready to go. So let's, let's go. Do it. Let's keep it 
punchy to the point. Some really good things happened at the end of last year for AT. Um, and they were some really good quality of life improvements for the game. The main one was resin weapons becoming plastic. So your Ursus Claw, your Natrix Shock Lance, Volkite Eradicator, they all became plastic in the Legions Imperialis box set. Mm -hmm. Um, And they released three new weapons in the form of the Swarm Missiles, Shudder Missiles, nearly forgot that for a second, and the Incisor Pattern Melter Lance. So three brand new weapons for Warhounds, three um, previously Forge World weapons uh, now in plastic. Obviously, the box separately is not available yet, but we think that that's probably just a question of time before they're available in their own box. And we saw a bit of a shift towards sort of long-term, um, I guess, like I say, quality of life for the AT range by the inclusion of terminals and weapon cards in some of the new AT Titan boxes. And, what a um, glorious day it is. Yeah. I, it, I, <laughs> How amazing. <laughs> the ones that you got in Forge World were... Well, they were shit. Let's be honest. Shit, like yeah. it was just it was paper, um, and if you even got them, because the Natrix Shock Lance and the Ursus Claw didn't have any weapons, they were only available. I think they were only available in the Shadow and Iron supplement as a photocopyable page. That's it. Yeah, um, and then did they eventually put it online to print? Um, I've, I've not checked, but I would hope no. so because otherwise, <laughs> how do you? I mean, you've got them at the uh, in all of the kind of um, Legio books now they have the, at the back of the tables they've got mm-hmm. some of them but they have now brought these to card which is great although it's not the kind of proper sort of board game quality card that you would get if you bought the little weapon card packs it's the same kind of um quality that you get in the Warbreaker and the Warmaster uh, kits so slightly thinner but still <laughs> but not paper <laughs> but not paper, much better, yeah. And you don't have to cut them out yourself, and mm. you know they're never misaligned and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I do stress that the weapon cards did not come in the Legion's Imperialist box set. So anyone thinking you're going to get the weapon cards in there, you're not. It's a different game. You're not going to get anything for AT in the Legion's Imperialist starter set. But Warcom came to everybody's rescue, and they've put up a downloadable PDF, and I think pretty much every single... Um, list provider like TIE Terminal and Battlescribe and all of those kind of people have now updated all of their um, rosters with the appropriate points and the skills. The skills? Mm -hmm. The the, the abilities and stats. The stats, that's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. Um, So big jump forward. When everybody thought that the game was dead, bang, in they come, three new weapons. I'm really looking forward to Beachhead because I think that will be one of the first major tournaments which we will see these three new weapons mm-hmm. um, in the flesh. And I'm very interested to see how they perform. Well, I have my opinions on them, and we're going to talk about these today, and I'm sure you have your opinions on them as well, Johnny. But mm-hmm. whether or not we are right or wrong, I guess, will be seen in the um, the fulcrum of uh, of battle at uh, Beachhead um, in just over six weeks' time. Oh. So let us start, shall we? With let's start with the missiles. Okay. So the swarm of missiles um, were one of the first things which were um, announced. Obviously, when they um, released the images of the missiles, everyone thought, "Oh, they're going to be Apox." You know, like this mm-hmm. is similar to sort of the what what do they call them? The arrays, the apocalypse missile launcher arrays on the shoulders of the war masters. Yeah. But no, they're completely different things, which is great because they were terrible. Yeah. <laughs> rubbish, rubbish little weapons. Um, but what it does mean as well is that things like um uh some of the upgrades and war gear which directly affects um apocalypse missile launchers. I think there's a is there an one for Ataris? the fiery thing mm-hmm. um won't affect these they are their own thing they're self-contained two different types of weapon so the first one is shudder sorry the first one is swarmer and the second one is shudder missiles so let's start with the swarmer missiles shall we so swarmer missiles come in at 10 points um they are a short range of 12 inches with a minus one to hit at 12 inches and below 
with a long range of 40 inches, five dice, strength four, with rapid. <clears throat> and I'm just going to clear my cough there as a nice gentle pause. <laughs> that feels pretty good to me. I love it. I really do. This is huge for your uh, long range uh, mana pools or uh, your um, your mixed mana pools, so like Regia, right? Warlords and exactly Warhounds that, yeah. always had the issue with uh, keeping, you know, keeping pace with each other. The Warhounds have to slow down, the Warlords have to speed up. This lets the Warhounds advance slowly with the Warlords and be in range to, you know, both share shields and, you know, shoot your opponent. Um, it's great. I love it. Um, it's a, a one less dice, uh, long ranged uh, Vulcan, essentially. I mean, the one thing it has lost over an APOC, of course, is barrage. So it is yeah. a direct line of sight weapon, and you're at best going to be hitting on a three up. Mm -hmm. But I agree. I think that um, five dice, we're kind of used to that with APOC missiles anyway. Um, it, it is, it's kind of like a mixture between the Apocalypse Missile Launcher and the Vulcan Megabolter. And I can see that, like you say, in, in maniples like um, the Regia, for instance, you could then use the Warhounds as shield strippers. You know, you could even maybe have two of these because it's only for 200 points now. You've got an alternative to the double Vulcan Megabolter Warhound. You've got the double mm -hmm. Swarmer Missile Warhound. I was going to say, they're so cheap as well. 10 points, you know, that's yeah. the uh, joint cheapest among a few Warhound weapon cards. So, I, I think that they had to be because, oh, yeah. you know, I mean, if it was any more than 10 points, <clears throat> I don't think anybody would take it because your Vulcan Megabolter exists. Um, a little bit different on the Warhound chassis because they don't have an APOC, for instance, but it feels like mm -hmm. a, a nice halfway house uh, between the two of them. And I think that these are going to get a lot of play. But yeah, you, you use those kind of in a regia for shield shield stripping, and then your big guns of your your warlords can then, you know, make the holes. Like they are for sure going into my Tritonus. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think that these are really good. Um, I'm pretty sure that people like Battlebling have already start working started work on some of their own versions of these as well. Mm -hmm. So availability being a problem at the moment with the fact that you can only get them from the Legion's Imperialist starter box, as of the time of recording. Um, I can see them making good trade on these sort of things. Big fan. Big fan of mm -hmm. this. I think that this isn't going to be the right weapon for every list. I still think the Vulcan Mega Bolter will perform, perform better on a something like a Ferox, which is close up. For sure, um, yeah. but, but as you say, if you've got like a back line... Um, Warhound. Previously, you were reliant on turbo laser destructors or the uh, conversion beamers. Well, they were the only real kind of long range options. Oh, and the the graviton. Mm. But you know, very low weapon, uh, very low dice count, and although pretty good, you know, the, the turbo laser destructor has, has got its moments for shield stripping. You've got to push for that, yeah. which is on always a risky. God, I hate on a warhound. Turbo lasers. <laughs> and it's only two dice, so yeah. you know at most you're only going to ship. Um, you're going to strip two shields. Um, mm. So I think, and, and uh, this is half the po half the cost of a turbo laser destructor. It's half the cost of a uh, graviton, and it's fifteen points cheaper than a, a sea beamer. And although you're going to use them for different things, I can see double swarmer missile um, warhounds being a thing, harassing around the back lines. You're going to have to push forward a little bit because 40 inches is not a full kind of width of a board table. But it's I mean, still... for a Warhound, that's a turn, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a normal move. Forward. You know, maybe a yeah. push at, at, at most, but... Di diagonally, maybe you're going to struggle, but like I think for the mm. most part, 40 inches seems and feels like a, a really good good range for this. So, mm -hmm. big fan. On the flip side of the card as well, it's um, disabled um, on a 9, as is all um, Warhound weapons, and it's repaired on a 3. So, you know, good, reliable, it gets blown off, you can repair it again fairly easily in the repair phase. And mm. when they're in that kind of three area, it's it's a good um, repair dice because how many times have you needed to make a choice between 
getting your reactor cooler or um, repairing a weapon. So yeah, right. now you've got an option with those threes that you inevitably roll on your two dice. Yeah, big fan. I love it. I really do. Shall we look at the Shudder missiles next? Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. cool, middle missiles. Oh, no, thank you. 20 points. Mm-hmm. Um, short range of 12, long range of 40, so exactly the same as a Swarmer missile. The difference being here is there is no negative to hit under 12 inches. Two dice, strength six, barrage and quake. What's your Gary, thoughts? Um, who gives a shit about the strength or the number of shots? The only thing that matters on that card is quake. I think this, out of everything, has the highest potential to be abused. Um, imagine, imagine going against you know a, a, a few warhounds equipped with uh, with these. Um, once your shield goes down, you are you're you're going to have your warlord in the middle of the board, basically ballerina dancing in circles. Um, yeah, I, ooh, it scares me. Let's be honest, right? This this is not a weapon that you're taking to do damage. No. It's strength six is not great. You are literally taking this weapon purely to apply the quake effect. And most of the time that is not going to do very much. Like certainly in the earlier round of the game, you're not gonna do very much um with that. Because shields will be up, you won't be able to get the hits on the on the armor to apply the quake. But we've increasingly over the years seen quake as being a serious hindrance to your opponent's um, objective play. And there's also a an element of removing player agency from that, which some people don't like. Uh, but it is a very valid tactic. And when you are, you know, full on quaked. You're moving half speed. It does make a big difference if you're trying to take objectives, which has become more and more popular. Well, more and more relevant in um, mm-hmm. match play. Now, I don't see these as being on every warlord for for that reason. You know, you you can't rely on these to do the damage, but this will go on a a warhound, maybe coupled with swarmer missiles as well, or maybe just a back end support <coughs> excuse me this plumbing cough be here for 12 weeks now um but yeah um a long range support um warhound that you look to stick on first fire and the moment mm-hmm. somebody's shields go down in the combat phase you activate this you get your quake in and then that titan is potentially quaked for the next like two rounds mm-hmm. because it's 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 impacted um, in the movement phase, if they're on full stride, they're impacted then in the um, full stride uh, in the in the full stride phase, and then they're impacted again. Correct me if I'm wrong. In the following movement phase, aren't they? Because it carry- that's why mm-hmm. you want to get the first fires off. And why Krytos can be so strong. Um, so yeah, it's. I think this is going to open up and introduce a lot of new tactics, which I'm very interested to see how that will go down at Beachhead. Mm-hmm. Where I can see this being particularly disgusting is in Krytos lists. Mm -hmm. Because Krytos have the Civilization's Ruin three-point stratagem, which means that you just have to hit hit with a weapon with Quake, and then they're Quaked. doesn't matter if their shields are up or down or or whatever. Now... A first turn. (laughs) Oh, can you imagine? Yeah. Jesus Christ. It's like the... um the multiple vortex all over again, isn't it? Just that first turn of absolute. Ugh. Well, they don't even need to pay the war gear because obviously they've got the upgrade to their Apox, haven't they? Which gives the, gives Apox quake, reduces their dice count. Um, You know, like you saw it predominantly, like when we got Stu on to do that um deep dive with us last year, mm-hmm. you know, he talked through his list, like Corsairs with, um, Apox up top and stuff, but that was that was a war gear upgrade for that. You know, mm. if you've got a Regia or you've got something like I don't know a Mandatum or something, which you know you maybe have a longer range um, 
or even if you want to take uh, well i think the red gear is the main one because you i think you can add, add an extra warhound a warlord can't you in the um mm-hmm. Krytos red gear um yeah it's 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 another thing that can quake for for 20 points so i think it balances well with the upgrade and the i forget how much the upgrade is i've got the book in front of me but like obviously apox are 10 points um and then the the Earthbreaker missiles are fifteen points, so it's five points cheaper to take Shudder missiles on a Warhound than the Earthbreaker missiles on a Krytos Reaver, as an example. But yeah, this one repaired on a four plus, um, which is you know slightly higher than the Swarm of missiles, and I think that that's deservedly so. Mm-hmm. Like I say, I don't. You, you ignore the strength entirely. Um, you're not here to apply the damage. Great if you get a hit in, awesome. But it's all about applying that quake. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how many of these we see um, come to Beachhead. Mm. Yeah, for sure. Shall we finish off this little se- this first segment um, with the incisor pattern melter lance? Hell yeah. So this was the one that everyone was kind of hoping would be the the real rival to the plasma blast gun. You know, finally having something a little bit different, um, which you know could could bring you know, a, a slightly different nuance to the Ferox game, for instance, or something like that. Now, um, the only version of this that we got to go on so far has been the shoulder melter cannons from the um warmaster which i think were range 16 um strength 10 i think um and i think that's where every with fusion obviously mm-hmm. um but i think that's where everyone was kind of thinking that these would go but obviously not being exactly the same because they're, they've got different names at the end of the day they're going to be different weapons different names now this comes in at 25 points per weapon it's got a short range of six. It's got a long range of ten, uh, and when you're over six inches, you are on minus one to hit. Um, you then have two dice at strength nine, and it has fusion. No blast like every other melter. This is a direct fire weapon, <coughs> which a does make it very almost. yeah, like a like a exactly that like a for sealing up doors or mm. cutting into them or something. Uh, very, very big doors. Like, very big doors. <laughs> very big doors. <laughs> um, and yeah, so... I... Everyone, uh, I really wanted this to be a real Good. choice between mm. kind of taking this or spending the 30 points and in getting a plasma blast gun. And for me, it's not quite there. No, uh, I like it for the lack of blast. Yes, it makes it different, and obviously, you know, and the other thing targeting that has to, huge, absolutely and, huge. Yeah, and no push Mm-mm. as well. I mean, there isn't on other melter weapons, but I think that's that's a big thing because there's so mm. many warhand weapons have got push, and well, they generally don't get taken because of that factor. I think this is a good. Warhound killer, like this, and a Vulcan Mega Bolter in a Ferox. You're not. You're going to have a very unhappy Warhound getting hit by it. Well, let, let's be honest. This this will kill anything, mm. not just Warhounds. I mean, it'll it'll decimate no, Warhounds. It, that's what I mean. Like it is it is you know, <laughs> you know it, I mean, it punches equally and up. If if you are in a Ferox and you are in the flank it's immediately strength 11 you know so it's immediately mm-hmm. a 13 if you roll a 2 on your d10 mm-hmm. um but this has a potential effective um strength up to 19 basic you know front flanks facing. and yeah uh, yeah not in a ferox 19 will crit anything in the game mm-hmm. the the only thing that I, I i i'm almost okay with the range as well like the 610 is kind of okay it's pretty rough <laughs> but it's okay it's it's the minus one to hit over six mm. inches i don't feel like it needs it i feel like 
we would still be questioning it at 10 inches with no, with no bonuses right to hit. Hmm. But the fact that it's nerfed over six inches again, it just... The, the, one of the best things about the Plasma Blast Gun is that even if you miss, you might hit. True. And with two dice, hitting on fours over six inches, mm -hmm. the real money for this is going to be made getting it into six inches. Yeah. It, that shouldn't be a problem for most maniples. Like, this has to go in something which is screaming forwards at the, you know, full full striding as early as possible. If you're a traitor player, you probably want to pop your two-inch extra um, unbridled hatred on that as well mm -hmm. and just get them up the board as quickly as possible, like full-on distraction carn effects. If you hit, it's going to hurt a lot. Yeah. If you hit. If you hit. Two shots is just... That's a gamble. Um, you know, It's in that kind of one to two hits. It's mm -hmm. not a guarantee, you know. If there was three, you know, oh well, at least two of those on average is going to go through. Remind but me the base ballistic skill of a uh, warhound. Three, Four. three plus. Oh, three. It is three plus. Okay, yeah. <coughs> That's assuming perfect conditions. You're in range, no cover, no. Well, this, this is assuming the shields are down as well. And so, yeah. for for anything else, you know, you have to be within six inches of it mm -hmm. to get the fusion effect. Um, you have to be. Um, their shields have to be down to get it to hit on a three at six inches. Mm -hmm. If you are going under the shield, you're then on weapon skills. So unless you are in a ferox, it's then a four plus. So it's even harder. And then it's really only one of those is going to hit. It'll punch a big hole. But I think mm -hmm. then, as you say, you need something else to really kind of capitalize on on bringing that down. I don't know if we... like is Is there room here... Is is there a build which is a plasma blast gun and an incisor pattern melter lance? No. What you use no. the blast? No. No, I, you'd no. be pushing for sit fives and sixes. I was thinking you? of two melt, uh, two incisors, two melter lances. Just imagine that. Fifty points. Just something just stripping the shields and just just four shots of that just would be grim. The, 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 the money here is in the ferox. Oh yeah. That, yeah, yeah. That's where that's where the money is, mm -hmm. because otherwise you are on a dicey kind of. It, it the range is weird. Like it, if it was a minus one at long range and a plus one at short range, so there was Would kind of like. Better. I think that that might have balanced it out as well. Mm. It's just something about it. It's just not quite there for me. Like. I, I need to see these on, and, and we haven't played with these at the moment yet. Of course, no. we are still kind no, of, no. this is theory crafting based on everything else that we've seen in AT. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to seeing, you know, in Feb to see if some of these get brought and how they, how they do. But mm. this, I think it's, if you're going to have that minus one, give it a plus one and really capitalize on that close range to give it, you know, a two plus to hit with a Ferox or a three plus to hit with everything else within two inches. Yeah. Cause, uh, yeah, know. it's hard, isn't it, right? Um, I think two. could could a plus one at short range be abused? I feel like Two plus to hit is, is, is pretty nasty, let's grim. be honest, right? Because then you're, I think, what, you're four plus in cooled shots? So whatever yeah. the Reaver does in a... Um, in the Maniple, you just have the cooled shot to finish off, you know, the yeah. unshielded, potentially damaged... Titan I mean, reali quite... realistically, this is doing one critical hit to mm -hmm. a location mm -hmm. immediately. It's just straight up critical hit, potentially two. Mm -hmm. But you've got quite a few dice to get through to to get to that. I like the fact it's not got um, draining anywhere. I just don't think it needs that minus one to hit at long range, like or or maybe they could have given it a twelve inch range. Just something a bit more, or increased mm -hmm. its short range to eight and its long range to twelve. Like, there's so many things about this that I think that could have been better to make it a true contender for the plasma blast gun. And you know, yes, it's got a higher 
absolute maximum. And yes, this will be a lot better against things like um, Porphyrians, mm-hmm. where you're going to be getting that, um, if you can get close to them, of course, if they don't nuke you on the way in with their silly amount of shots. Um, but it's it can crit a Porphyrian, which I think only the only the sea beamer on the warhound can do um, mm. otherwise it's a four plus to repair fine that's okay yeah yeah happy strong with weapon that. slightly harder to repair yeah but not terrible no um no. yeah i i still think unfortunately the king is not dead the plasma blast gun vulcan mega bolter combo is still going to see a lot of use I the one thing I do think is maybe the the Vulcan now has got a a direct competitor for a different reason with the Swarmer. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so maybe we'll see that meta change up slightly, where we'll have plasma blast gun Swarmer missiles for a slightly longer ranged build. Mm. But you know, I, I unfortunately I think he is still very much on his pedestal. Um, Every time I call one of these, though, one of these deep dives that we do, like I always get it wrong. Like I thought the C beamer was going to be immense, and but then, just... <laughs> well, two dice again, even at mm. long range. Like um, the problem that I had with the C beamer is it's just when it works, it's great. When it doesn't, it's crap. Yeah. Like it's Turned there's reliable. no kind of yeah, there's there's no average that you mm. can kind of rely on. It's a bit swingy, and you are not going to have any choice with, with the Melter Lance other than to push, push, push. And if, you know, if they stop you getting a full stride or you fail on a full stride and you lose a turn, then I know what I would be targeting first just because I don't want that thing getting close to me. Because when it no. does and when it hits, it will hurt. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, for sure. There you go. Let us know what you think in the comments, guys. Like, um... You know, this is two dudes on the internet um, reading off of a sheet and like talking nonsense. So, like, have we missed something with either of these two? Are you going to be taking any of these in your lists? Um, how do you think these will um, will play on the battlefield? And yeah, I think we should circle back on this in like two months' time after the dust has settled on Beachhead and the, the post Beachhead. Uh, yeah. Yeah, well, hopefully Matt will run his um, sort of meta watch mm. article again for Beachheads, where he looks at everything that was taken and all of the weapons that were taken, and you know, uh, we'll we'll get to see a, a few more stats, um, which is always good to see. If you are interested in that kind of stuff, if you go over to our website uh, www.maximalfire.com, dot com, under the articles section, there are a bunch of articles um, related to. Um, Better at our events that we've run over the last couple of years. So if you want to see what is everybody taking in the UK for maniples or chassis or weapons and that kind of stuff, um, it's a, it can be a really interesting read if that floats your boat. I think this next section is uh, it's very much your speciality here, Alex. So, um, yeah. Speciality. You know, I've played with them a few times. They are my second Legio. They yeah. are my. I've had a lot of fun with Legio Tempestus. And I don't know how we kind of forgot to do a Legio deep dive with them. But um, I you'll find New all Year, the files on your computer and just be like, oh, damn, we've we yeah. have done it. <laughs> just haven't published it. <laughs> yeah. Or even worse, like, you know, we're at the point now, we've done like 30 odd episodes. Mm and um, some of them are on youtube some of them aren't and we've just missed it somewhere along the lines i think the only time we've talked about these guys in the past has been mm. in the um no we haven't actually because we haven't done uh, as everyone keeps reminding us we haven't done the traitor legios ranked Not episode yet. yet um it will come we'll try and get it done this year um no it, it is gonna come we're sorry it's been a long time coming <laughs> we're gonna get it done um I have always liked Legio Tempestus just from a lore perspective. And if you want to find out more about the lore, then there is a video on our lore section um, related to Tempestus. One of the Triad Ferrum Mogulus, the original Titan Legions. And um, how it all kind of plays out for them over the course of the Horus Heresy is, is really interesting. And uh, I've 
always liked the fact that these guys could easily be argued as being loyalists as much as being traitors. Like the, a big portion mm. of them did turn traitor, but there was a real solid core of loyalist Tempestus, which unfortunately for the most part got completely eradicated on Mars, but still pockets of them kind of like about the galaxy. Mm. Even Fighting. in uh, 40k, right? They're still around. Well, Tempestus, yeah, they were later exonerated um, mm. because of the um, their actions during the Horus Heresy, and the traitor version of Tempestus became Tempestor. So Tempestor. there was Tempestor. So there was oh. a split, <laughs> a schism in the Legio. Um, mm. So Tempestus being very much the loyalists, and Tempestor being the the bad guys. And I was mm. super confused the first time I picked up the AT rulebook and went to the back, and I was like. They were talking about Tempestus being bad guys. I was like, what? What? <laughs> no, 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 no. I've missed something here. Because <laughs> it's very different, right? Yeah. From the 40K yeah, law. Sure. <clears throat> so we're going to go through this like we did the others. Um, if you've ever watched any of our other deep dives, if you haven't, scroll back through our previous histories uh, of episodes that we've released and, and maybe check them out for yourself. We're going to start up with the traits. Then we'll start talking about the um the princeps abilities and then lastly we'll start talking about mana pools and we'll briefly touch on corruptions and things like that so without further ado let us start with our first trait glory in death it is the creed of the legio tempestus crew that the manner of their death is as important as anything they do in life crews will fight on to the bitter end obtaining firing solutions and stoking the reactor even as their titan comes apart around them before making a catastrophic damage roll for a Legio Tempestus Titan, the controlling player may make a command check for the Titan. If the check is passed, the Titan may immediately make an attack with one of its weapons, chosen by the controlling player. If the check is passed by three or more, the Titan immediately attacks with all of its weapons instead. Subtract one from all hit rolls for attacks made in this way. After resolving any attacks, roll on the catastrophic damage table as normal. I really like... Um, this trait and it's particularly better with larger titans uh, certainly kind of reaver scale upwards where you've got a command value of um four you know and and obviously three for the um, for the bigger titans the warlords your titans are going to die it's just an inevitable fact um of kind of like the way that games play out mm. it's very rare for you not to lose titans um during a game and this isn't so much as sort of like planning for failure because it's it's just an inevitable truth. <clears throat> now, you can't obviously get your princeps abilities in here. So you're not getting a plus two like you would for orders or anything, but it's just basic command check allows you to fire one weapon. And the amount of times I played these guys and an enemy Titan has been like just so close to death <laughs> and I've not quite managed to fit uh, to finish him off. Being able to kind of then apply an, an out of sequence attack against that Titan or against any other Titan is really strong. And especially kind of like if you're kind of looking at the, if you're quite close, for instance, when you've got a Reaver with a Gatling Blaster, you know, say under eight inches where you're getting that plus one to hit for close range, you're basically attacking for normal. You're not on that minus one to hit. It's just a straight up negative. So you, most of the time you'd be hitting on a four plus. And the amount of times that, my titan has been killed i've passed my roll i've then shot everything uh, or even one weapon back and i've killed that person's titan as well it kind of this chain reaction of events which just happen and it is really not to be underestimated and being able to if you pass it by three so a six or more for a warlord or a seven or more for a um reaver or an eight or more for a, a warhound being able to fire everything is is immense now and and again the bigger the actual titan the the better you know you're passing on a six plus with a warlord um and then being able to fire all three warlord weapons is obviously significantly better generally speaking than passing on an eight plus for a, a warhound and firing two weapons because when you lose a, a warlord it's a significant portion of your force which has just died and being able to get one last shot and unleash everything that that has got available to it 
is is really powerful and and can be really can be really really good and then on top of that as well you then roll on your catastrophic damage table <clears throat> so things can happen like if you get wildfire for instance you know okay le- less control right and it's it's worse ballistic skill but you shoot and then with a lucky roll or something you end up pointing and shooting at the same thing again automatically as part of wildfire so even more fire goes into them you know and then it falls over like it's it's really really strong there's also a really interesting i i've never been able to get it off but in theory it's it's always worked in my head there is a princeps ability which i took because we rolled for them at um uh, greetings from the walls yeah and um one of my guys got uh, i believe it's called iron will which um allows you to you roll when you when you are to suffer um, catastrophic damage, if you can roll more than what you rolled on the catastrophic damage table, you don't suffer the catastrophic effect. Mm. So there's a situation which this is proper fringe, and you like whether or not you want to take that ability over some of the other ones, which are arguably better. But you could die. Your titan could die. You do your glory and death attack where you get all of these off. Mm. You then roll on the catastrophic damage table. Say you roll a four. You then roll your iron will. So say you get a five. Your Titan's still alive. So you've you've fired your glory and death, but you've negated the catastrophic damage table to allow you to still stay alive. Holy and, shit, that's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah, I like uh, that. The one time that that happens, it will be glorious, but it's oh, yeah. like proper fringe, proper mm. fringe stuff. But all the, all weekend when we were playing that, I was like, oh, just just please, <laughs> just kill him. <laughs> Nobody killed that princeps the whole game. Mm. And although it's nice for him not to die, I just really wanted to see if it was possible to get off. I mean, <laughs> you know, if you roll a mag death, uh, sorry, a catastrophic meltdown or something, you know, tough shit really. And yeah. then your princeps senioris ability has done nothing. But um, yeah, I it it is not to be underestimated getting one free um, attack or, or potentially one free attack or potentially multiple attacks in a round um, before you die. I've this has won me games, um, mm. and although I wouldn't say that it is a S tier um, ability, I still think it's it's very strong, very very useful, and is certainly one of the better. Um, the geo abilities which is around there mm. yeah um on death abilities are always a mixed bag for me i feel a lot of the time it's um uh i think rewarding failure might be a bit dramatic but um definitely something you know negative has to happen for you to to benefit from it that being said um out of sequence shooting is insane in titanicus really really good um, so yeah, I think that kind of keeps it from being just a an on death ability that you don't you know you don't really want to rely on and make it more kind of like okay we can get some traction out of this and as you said you know it's it's one new game so you you can um, if you have enough titans going down that's a quite a lot of extra shots throughout a game you know so I I played a game that um, with Ben uh, formerly of the podcast um, mm. last year with this it was one of his first back into playing at again and it was i think it was one of the early games i played with tempest i think we talked about in a previous episode where basically i just both of us just shot stuff and forgot entirely about the objectives and (laughs) um it was it was a silly fun game but that was that exact scenario where he shot me and things were looking really badly for me because i was now tight multiple i think i was two titans down at that point he just was one shotting things but this reaver was killed I passed it by three. He immediately shot back and immediately tracked and killed the um, Titan that had just killed me. So it it kind of swung the game again immediately, allowing me to kind of claw a little bit back for free, essentially, um, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, it it seems... uh, It it is strong, for sure. Um, And like you said as well, stuff is going to die in AT. It's just the nature of the game. It's quite a, a lethal game. As the turns go on. So, next one. Mm -hmm. Fury of the Machine. 
Princeps of the Legio Tempestus have ever been known for their wrath and zeal both in the field of battle and away from it, and this trait has been passed on to their god engine's machine spirits through the technological sorcery of the manifold. Once per round when firing a weapon, a Legio Tempestus Titan that has one or more points of critical damage may add one to the strength value of that weapon. The weapon must have a strength value of 4 or higher, and the strength value cannot be increased above 10. This can be used in conjunction with Glory and Death. So this is another one of those kind of things which you could say, you know, again, you are almost sort of banking on failure, on things dying, on taking crits. But an early crit that you take and don't really then, they're not able to capitalize on is actually, as long as it's not kind of going to mess you up too bad, mm. um, is actually quite useful. If it was on the legs or somewhere like that where, you know, you're just going to turn a little bit... Um, during your your phase being able to add plus one to one of your weapons strengths is um is pretty useful like you combine that with like um abilities in a ferox maniple um, mm. for an additional plus one for instance if you're within your scale um and those numbers can ramp up and up and up and like i said it can be used in conjunction with um glory and death so as long as you haven't used that ability already in the round when you die, you can go, okay, well, my Gatling for this round um, is going to be strength six instead of strength five when he shoots at you, you know, or my melt, oh, no, you can't do melter because that would be strength 12, it's above strength 10. But what is an interesting nuance is on plasma weapons. So you can't increase the strength above 10, but the strength of a plasma weapon is eight. So you can increase the strength to 9, from 8 to 9, and then after that, the maximal fire effect kicks in. So you can go up to strength 11 with plasma weapons because the maximal fire trait is not incorporated in the weapon strength. The weapon strength is what is on the card. And because Glory and Death is not one of these quote-unquote sort of automatic attacks it is still a full attack and we didn't mention this before but you have complete player player agency over that attack mm. unlike in um you know wildfire where you just have to take it as is you can still use your weapon traits you can still call shots you can do all of that as normal you're just suffering a minus one to hit so being able to push that damage on certain big weapons up by one very very useful and although but this is to, to me kind of like a, a bit of a, a cherry on on the top and this just makes that glory and death thing just that little bit more potent yeah same as before right you know it is a uh, requiring a, a failure a negative to activate um uh, my <laughs> my biggest issue i think with it would be the uh, remembering to actually activate it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's um, the big one. Especially if you, and, yeah, if if you're not dead, mm -hmm. remembering to use it is a is a big one. Yeah, um, if you're dead, then you should definitely remember to use it because you've definitely taken criticals at that point. But like I say, it's those stealth crits that you have here and there. Sometimes it's worth not repairing that um, that point of critical if if your Titan can manage it, like a Reactor One, for instance, um, Reactor Elite One on a Warlord. Could probably tank that one, yeah. Especially if it was like a a brawling a non training, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and and then to be able to make it a strength eleven, um, Sun Fury, for instance, is mm. is pretty pretty nice. Um, yeah, it's it's a good little trait. Like it a lot. Yeah. Nice. Okay, next up we get onto the stratagems. Combat drop three points. The epitaph of the Stormlords matched the Legio Tempestus' practice of orbital dropping Titans directly into the thick of the fighting, a tactic few other Titan Legions would countenance. This stratagem can be purchased by any Legio Tempestus player. Play this stratagem at the start of the deployment before any units have been placed on the battlefield. Choose a friendly Legio Tempestus Titan of scale 7 or lower to be kept in reserve. That unit is not deployed as normal and instead will arrive by combat drop. At the start of any strategy phase from the second round onwards, the chosen Titan is deployed by combat drop. Place the Titan unit anywhere on the battlefield more than 3 inches away from an enemy unit, then scatter the Titan d6 inches. If the Titan scatters into a piece of terrain, it stops before moving into it and suffers d3 plus 2 strength 9 hits. 
void shield saves are allowed. If after it scatters, the Titan's base overlaps with another model, friend or foe, with a scale lower than the Titan's, move the Titan the shortest distance so its base is not overlapping, then resolve the effects of a collision. If the Titan's base overlaps that of a unit with a scale equal to or greater than its own, the Titan is destroyed. Do not roll on the catastrophic damage table. The unit it overlapped with suffers a collision as normal. A Titan that arrives in this way cannot be activated in the strategy or movement phase in the round it arrived. So, what does it do? <laughs> Deep strike. Yeah. Deep strike a Titan. Jesus, that's war and peace. Yeah, a bit of a mouthful to yeah. kind of get around. Um, the interesting thing about this one is it says scale 7. Now, we know that there is no scale 7 Titan out there at the moment. So. Yet. Yet. So this may be something that is put in place later on, which would be good. But really what you're looking at here is you are deep striking direwolves or you are deep striking warhounds, scale six. Now, the only thing which is not going to immediately remove the Titan if you land on it is going to be knights who are going to take a collision. Every other Titan, if you end up with your base overlapping um, another Titan, that Titan is dead it is gone saying that i have never been in a situation where that has happened to me um you just need to be a bit savvy about where you're placing your titan it's an expensive strat at three points however it's one that is every single time in my um in my list uh, in my stratagem hand uh it is kind of like for me, I feel like it is a better outflank. Um, from that, you know, you can basically you know put it anywhere on the board, really, mm. and you don't have to declare where that is until you need it. So you don't have to go, oh, they're coming on from that side or that side. And although it is expensive at three, like it has, you know, scored me objectives like salt the earth, where you've got to get really, really close to an objective. I've used this in con conjunction with a um concealment barrage and dropped mm. him in the concealment barrage um and because it's in the strategy phase you can deploy it first and then you can put the concealment barrage on top of it you don't have to do hope that you land in there because it's only scattering d6 on a hit it doesn't move it just stays where it is so you've got a one in three chance of it going exactly where you want it to be and the other two times you just need to make sure that you're six inches away from another unit and you're you're laughing getting objectives it's is its main advantage however throwing a cat amongst the pigeons in the back lines <laughs> it's it is can be really really funny and satisfying and um it'll immediately put your opponents on the back foot hmm. <clears throat> it is um combined with the new uh incisor pattern if you started bullying a um Warbringer or Warbreaker? I always get confused with Battleblings. Um... Oh, the Warbreaker. Yeah, the big yeah. boy. Okay, the big so boy. the Warbringer, the artillery one, if you had a, um, yeah, an incisor, melter, warhound, bullying that in the back line yep. from a successful the, drop. Another thing I've toyed with and never actually done, but what I've played around with is deep stroke, striking a neutron dial, uh, dire wolf. Mm. And you, you know, if you end up getting that behind, say, a warlord, mm. for instance in the rear, increasing its strength to, what is it, basic? Is it seven basic? Oh, seven. I want to say seven, yeah. Um, you know, t to nine, you know, that mm. shock is going to be, you know, you you're going to be causing a shutdown. Mm. Um, is it here? Do they put the I've got the cards next to me. Uh, let me have a... I don't think they actually bothered putting the direwolf um, weapons in the... Um, oh, no, I didn't bring it, though. I haven't got the latest book in front of me. I've only got the trying to mm. one but uh but yeah so it can be great you know and coupled with um a ferox for instance is usually where i use it you're charging your guys up in the front um they're, they're focused on that if you can get a guy in the back line as well harassing them from behind finishing them off or what have you it can be very very useful it's think of it as as outflank but with a lot more options and mm. you could immediately deploy it on a um objective for instance just deep strike straight down take an objective 
not to be um not to be ignored you are obviously at a activation disadvantage until mm-hmm. you know that comes in but it's not one that you'll necessarily want to use every single time um but having it in a strat hand as an option is very very useful i wouldn't use this if i was coming across knights for instance because you just need to bully the knights as much as you can with as much firepower as you can and static Preferably rain from would go range. in yeah from range <laughs> uh, you know static rain would be my, be my three pointer yeah. in there rather than um combat drop but <clears throat> it is still a very nice one to have um up your sleeve especially if you're up against bigger titans than you and you need to try and get in behind them because mm-hmm. um yeah can be very very nasty indeed um obviously you are telegraphing where you are though that's that's one of the main things with it happening in the strategy phase they know that you are there and they can react to you in the movement phase um which is why sometimes like i say a concealment barrage can be very very handy because you know you if you bring it down turn two you sacrifice that movement on and, and shooting on turn two um mm. although if you equip them with shudder missiles of course they could now barrage out of the uh, um concealment barrage very true um but yeah um it can then act as normal in its um um following phase so mm. yeah very 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 good yeah, a lot, a lot of CP, but it's it's strong, you know. Yeah. I mean, if you're combining it with then concealment barrage as well, you are you are hedging on this this trick, you know, working out. Uh, it's a lot of CP to spend on a on a maneuver, so you better be sure that you're you're putting them in the in the right location. Yeah, um, I mean, most of the time it's four out of five, right? Which is mm-hmm. a lot. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, but worth it in some situations. Yeah, that's sure. that. That's how I scored Salt the Earth in the earliest phases um, at events. I think it was at Dougie's uh, Swansea event. I took them, mm. and uh, I played against um, Ollie um, with the um, Osadax, mm-hmm. and uh, that was how I was able to take his objective for a combination of obfuscation caused by concealment barrage and also um, the deep strike, and that ultimately won me the game because it got me the twenty five points, which was you know the important thing. Mm. Right. Last piece of war gear. Well, first piece of war gear, last piece of trait. Kazmata pattern laser destructors. The Legio Tempestus displayed a heavy preference for their use of modified laser weaponry that provided greater range than the base patterns. Any Legio Tempestus Titan that is equipped with a turbo laser destructor, paired turbo laser destructor, paired laser blaster, or laser blaster can be upgraded with Kazmata pattern laser destructors at the cost of five times the dice value of the weapon, e.g., Paired laser blasters would be plus 30 points. Each weapon a Titan is armed with must be upgraded separately. A weapon with this upgrade increases its short range characteristics by 6 inches and its long range characteristic by 3. Now, I'm not the biggest fan of lasers. I think that the strength is a bit too low at 8, but they can be fine. Um, I prefer laser blasters over turbo laser destructors purely because you've got more dice three dice you know is kind of in that area where you can fish for um targeted shots and things like that Mm -hmm. turbo laser destructor is definitely probably one of my my personal lowest rated weapons yeah you can get on a warhound they're just that it's just not good at anything really no and this doesn't really add anything, in my opinion, to um, the Turbo Laser Destructor mm. because the Turbo Laser Destructor has got a really long range um, and it has no benefit to being in short range n- n- or long range and no negative to being in short range or long range. All you're doing is increasing that long range effectively up by three inches, uh, which is would take it to... Oh, I can never remember. It's 40... Is it 42... 32 so it would take it up to um 35 inches of range which is great yeah you got (laughs) three three inches inches. oh man yeah the blaster however is a minus one to hit over 16 inches now increasing a laser blaster's short range profile from 16 inches to 22 inches is actually con- considerably better because most combat takes place in that 20 inch sort of range. So mm. you are negating a minus one against that 
However, it's quite expensive. A laser blaster would be the equivalent of, oh, it's 25 points base. It checks the book again. I think it's 25 points base plus 15. Um, you know, you're talking 40 points for mm-hmm. um, a laser blaster, which is kind of, you know, a middling weapon at best. It's more expensive than a, a melter at that point, which is only slightly shorter range. It's, you know, 15 points more expensive than a volcano cannon, mm. which has got higher strength. And if you miss, it still scatters. So this isn't one I use very often, and often it's only one that I use if I've got points to spare. Mm. Where I think these are best applied is possibly on Warbringers, where you have a long-range, standing-at-the-back type titan, um, and you want to be able to just give it a little bit more firepower, because often I find they're, they're unless they really press on you, you're you're playing over thirty over, um, you know, sixteen inches with those things. So having a you know straight up three plus up to twenty two inches on those is is pretty pretty good and can double in well with a melter gun or something like that. But other than that, I don't really take these very often it all comes down to you know what weapons you like playing with i don't particularly like playing with um lasers i think that outside of a Griffonicus or um a uh venator reaver extergamus mm. or just a general extergamus with you know one of those up top it's just not really kind of um it just, I, I don't feel like it's worth taking them it's um, if you're able to pump them to strength ten, they can become pretty terrifying, and that's where I think that they will really kind of excel. So if you took these on an extergamus on a paired laser blasters up top, you know, and especially with carapace weapons where you know a, a, a warlord's got a ten inch dead zone in front of it, you know, that would normally be with laser blast. You've only got six inches of optimal range in front of you from 10 to 16 inches where you're not suffering a minus one to hit, which is pretty poor, but you slap on Kazmas laser destructors and then that goes up to 22 inches and you've got a whole 12 inch range at that point, which is, is really good and strength 10. So not really a war gear that I use very often, but um, it certainly has its uses and depending on your play style and the manifolds that you're taking, it can be very good. Hell yeah. Yeah. Don't like lasers mid move on. <laughs> 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 yeah, mid. Okay, on to the, um, the personal traits. Adamantium Resolve. The Princeps' will is unbreakable, a fact proven on dozens of battlefields over decades of war. Once per battle, when the Princeps fails a command check, they may instead choose to pass it. So, sounds on the face of it a little bit like Ironclad Tyrant, where you can mm. re-roll your um, orders. But this is command check. So something like this is is all right if you are expecting it to die. Right. Because if you're expecting it to die and you want to guarantee getting off the glory and death. Yes. Right. You can use it. However, <clears throat> you may well pass that roll anyway, in which case you've wasted a um um your personal traits slot. If it was once per turn, mm. I think it would be significantly better. And uh, But I don't really think that there is enough play in this situation to warrant it. Like The main benefit here is it's a command check, so it could be on machine spirit um, failures or it could be on glory and death failures or anything else. Mm which you know is is a command check. I mean I guess you can have it in your in your back pocket for the game and then if by the end of the game or you know if by when this titan gets destroyed you've still got it um you know still got it available perfect now you can use it. I yeah but, I just I just don't I think there's more there's more distance and more mileage in other things. Yeah. Um for something that I don't like taking traits personally that you may never need or mm-hmm. you may never get to use or the circumstances may not come up that allows them to trigger. Um, and like I say, or taking this one 
knowing that you're going to get glory and death off great but then you inevitably then pass it by three plus because all this would do would be allow you to pass it mm. so you'd only be firing one weapon at that point yeah and also Rather- it's probably going to be on a warlord as well um so you know Depending on your mana pool, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, probably yeah. though, let's be real. If you're really leaning into the switch, if you're taking a trait for it as well as the other stuff, you're yeah. you're leaning into it quite heavily, you know? Um so yeah. When you're gonna fail a command check remember with, with Warlord. Yeah. So some play, I guess, but pretty average. Yeah. Um there's there's other things which in my opinion do better than this. Mm-hmm. Uh next up Stormborn. Stormborn. On the battlefield, the Princeps is a deadly tempest, tearing into the heart of the foe and scattering any who stand against them. While the Princeps Senioris is on the battlefield, Titan within the same maniple, including the Princeps Senioris' Titan, issued with a charge order may declare power to locomotors without pushing its reactor. Pretty good. I quite like that one. Um, mm. I can't say that I've ever taken it um, just because of, of the maniples I've taken in the past, but if you were on a full Ferox or a Corsair or something like that, which was very much leaning into a um, you know a melee or close range list, um, being able to um, get a free push for movement is pretty good. Mm. Um, and it's any t- Titan that's issued that charge order in the maniple as well. So it's you know, and every round, you know, as long as he's on the battlefield. So I, I think that that's quite good. And with the right mana pool, um, getting that bonus, you know, that, that push without worrying about failing, it's just one less dice roll mm-hmm. to get off. And you know that, okay, well, my Corsair there, they're going to be moving nine inches as long as I get the um, charge order off. And if you've, you know, doubled down on things like overwhelming rage or something like that, if you corrupted your Titan, then you know that you're getting then a a bonus um you know the automatic charge order off um or if you have doubled up with um what's the stratagem the traitor stratagem is it blood thirst which uh, yeah. allows you the bloodlust blood bloodlust blood gives lust, you right? a bonus yeah. to is it is it is that one that you you get it for free or it's a plus 2 or something it's been a while since mm-hmm. i've used that mm-hmm. one but, um it is uh, who's going to find it first? Dun, dun. Yeah. Uh, Warlust? That. No, that's the... War- um... No, that's the other one, but that's, that is yeah. still quite good. That's the one that adds two to their boosted speed. Hmm. So Bloodlust... Um, sorry, Warlust works well um, alongside um, the other one. <laughs> Where the is other it? One. Whatever it's called. It's gonna, you're going to absolutely kick Blood off. Blood Thirst, yeah. Blood Thirst, yeah. Um, right. add, it adds... Okay. Um, Two to any hit rolls made against um, Titan's enemies within two inches of them and adds mm-hmm. two to their command check when attempted to issue a charge order. So, you know, that coupled with Warlust, for instance, where you're getting plus two when um, they, um, on their boosted speed, and um, in addition to the plus two on the full stride, obviously they want to charge here, but this is one of those situations where I often take Warlust just for the extra two inches of movement, not for the two um, additional bonus to full striding. It can be useful to get other things up. If you yeah. pop that on on a turn, if you're taking them as traitor and you pop that on a turn, you've got some, a, a reaver who wants to charge. Well, he's getting his... He's on charge order because um, he's passed or whatever, or you've done something else. He's on um, nine-inch basic um, because of the free push. You're then getting two inches to eleven inches for the um, warlust, and then you could slap on unbridled hatred for an additional two inches on top of that as well, which takes him up to thirteen inch um, charge range, which gives him a fifteen inch threat range. Um, you know that is, say, three dice for a um, chain fist, and an additional four dice for the twelve inches um, that they potentially moved. Mm. So. I like that. It also means that they can reserve their um, reactor for if they're shot at or anything else that they might need to do. Like perhaps they need to make a three turns before they charge or something because somebody's got behind them. Or you know, you can yeah. use it for other things. I like it. 
I think mm-hmm. in some maniples it works really well. I've not, like I say, I've not personally taken it, but that's because I've been trying to not take Ferox maniples because I, I've taken so many of those. My Tempestus I've been using and running slightly differently for the most part. Defiant Warrior. Death holds no fear for the Princeps, and in the face of insurmountable odds, they will fight that much harder. If the Princeps Seniorus' Titan has a Void Shield level of X, it may re-roll any hit rolls of 1 when making an attack. Um, I, this is okay. Yeah. Um, you know, your shields are probably going to go down. Um, where this does stack nicely is back in with that glory and death. Yeah. Because chances are you are, um, going to have lost your shields and you're going to be on a minus one to hit because of the, um, glory and death and then being able to, um, Reroll ones. Um, on top of that, is is really really nice. Hmm. So again, it's I think this out um, is is definitely if you're going to lean into glory and death, this is more useful than adamantium resolve, uh, the first one that we talked about. Um, but I don't I don't I don't generally don't like kind of running on the basis of oh my I'm going to assume that my shields are going to go down and. Again, it's another thing you need to remember. Oh, yeah, his shields are down. I, I'm now I'm re-rolling ones. It's another thing to think about. But that tied in with glory and death with the plus one to your strength means that if and when he does die, he's he's going to make a mess of things. Oh, for um, sure. And like if you are taking those sort of primaries and secondaries where you've got to keep them alive, and your opponent knows that you're trying to keep them alive, you know it'd be a good one to to kind of use because they're going to be gunning for your princeps because they know um, what you've got. Whether or not I would take this as my single, if I had one um, princeps, if I would purely take this, I might. yeah, I might do. Um, especially if it was in something like a, a bigger maniple and it was a, you know, big guy, yeah. um, like a warlord. Um, so a real mixed bag, I think, the personal traits. I think um, Defiant Warrior is the standout for me. Um, I do like Stormborn as well in some lists. Um, there's definitely options of play within the Tempestus personal traits. Um, it just so happens that every time I end up going to a tournament or something like that, we often you kind of rely on the same old things, tried and trusted, which you know are going to work every single time. So my list that I took were um, predominantly, um, I, I, I took a Mandatum and a a minimum mandata minimum ferox i think so the last tournament i did i did something completely i think at greetings i took a minimum arcus minimum yeah some weird um, perpetua i think yeah. it was just to try it out um but in that situation there i often have a volcano cannon on my warlord so i tend to favor something like favored by fortune on on them those single dice rolls so i can get a reroll if and when i need it with the bellicosa um, but yeah, there's, there's definitely some play depending on your list within these. There's some nice ones. There's nothing in here, which is kind of Graphonicus's, um, reckless maverick levels of like awesome. Yeah. Um, but they are generally okay. There's, there's Tempestus is one of those ones where I think it's got some good traits and it's got some good, um, personal traits as well, because often the ones which have got really, really strong traits have got pretty rubbish, um, personal traits. So it's nice to see that um, there's a bit of a balance in here. Like, I don't think that they, Tempestus, have got overtly OP traits. Like, no. there's no civilization's ruin in there, right? No. Or offensive surge. But there is other good things in here. I think these are a nice kind of balanced Legio, and that's why I've always enjoyed um, playing them. I also play them loyalists more often than not. Um which means I haven't played them a lot as, as traitors and they work really well as either, certainly from a fluff perspective, as well as a, um, um, just ability perspective. Mm. One of the main reasons that I take Legio Tempestus as loyalist in tournaments is I think that the way the meta is at the moment, unbridled hatred, um, isn't as useful as it used to be compared to, um, adaptive tactics. Um, and some people would be like, what the hell are you talking about? I think since the introduction of the direwolf, 
adaptive tactics has become much stronger because it allows you to change an order um in at, at the end of the um damage control phase so if you are shut down by a neutron laser you can go and adaptive tactics and he's back on a something else so you'll mm-hmm. still have lost all Hopefully your shields not a but shut you... down again <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah well you can yeah yeah you can change it right you yeah, can change yeah. it yourself to what you know it's not like sabotage where you're rolling no but no. um you can um you'll have lost your shields which is one of the main things that hurts with shutdown but um you can also guarantee uh that you're not losing a whole turn of firing which in some of the heavier maniples can be quite painful mm. um i also like long retreat um i and there's just like there's all comes down to your play style i guess at the end of the day i think that the loyalists have got more abilities which are a bit more kind of adaptive whereas the um traitors are very much overt get up the table get in your face more, much more aggressive um ones but you know great crusade titans um for loyalists is a, is an incredible um stratagem to play for two points um for any legio that's going to be charging mm. two additional dice on the charge you know bonus to um the to get the charge order off it's very very useful so although you can play them as traitors they work equally well um for warlords and they are if you want to dabble with both and you know they are a good legio to try it out with and and similarly for the corruptions as well there's nothing in the corruptions which particularly lean into any of the traits you can do more or less whatever you want with them so if you wanted to do a ferox then you know your organic protrusions and your overwhelming rages and all of that kind of stuff is very very useful um there is literally you aren't leaning into anything strongly which means that the corruptions aren't kind of as powerful as they might be for really doubling Mm. down on soaking up damage for say more daxis or someone like that but it means that they're very very flexible and that's what i like about tempestus they they are a traitor legio which still feels a bit more flexible like you see more on the loyalist legio abilities more mm-hmm. so than you see on the traitor legios um and then last but least maniples again really really flexible you can pretty much take anything with these um i've ran what have i run mandatum ferox arcus perpetua um corsair like there's not one that kind of is better than another. Um, I would say probably not like your light maniples, like Lupercals. I think you want to be kind of looking more at getting at least one Warlord in there somewhere, which is why I quite like the Mandatum um, for Warhounds and a um, a Warlord. However, to get the most out of their abilities, you want at least a, a handful of Warhounds for the combat drop. So you need to be able to sacrifice one to go in there. And I would usually put one of my, if I took a Ferox, one of the Ferox Warhounds would be the first thing to go in the combat drop because they're immediately going to be close. Mm-hmm. Um, they've also got, um, I hadn't made any notes on this, as, um, actually, unfortunately, but they've got a, um, is it Mantellum Fulman? Is that the right? Um, or is he just one of my named guys? There is a <laughs> Titan of Legion, a, a, a ti- Titan of Legend um, for um, Tempestus. He is a Warhound. Um, his main ability is that you can first fire every weapon rather than just one. All right. I think with the new weapons, maybe yeah, with Swarm with missiles. Swarmers, yeah, that's pretty you know, fun. Yeah. Double um, Swarmers. <laughs> but I've, I've not really used him for that. Um, I know a lot of events currently ban um, Titans of Legend predominantly because some of the ones which you can really abuse things like um, Bellator... Mango, as uh, the community has started calling him, <laughs> Bell End Mango, yeah. um, and um, Hammer of Tyrants, which can be pretty sick, um, and also what's the Ibn Farouk for um, Furians? Mm-hmm. But yeah, I think that's um, about sort of sums up Legio Tempestus. Really, I've really enjoyed playing them. They've got a great color scheme as well, which really appeals to me. They look pretty on the on the on the board. Um, really fun legio to play and and really it, it's really good for doing anything with mm. any last thoughts on that johnny 
Um, yeah, I, I I quite like them. Like them. Um, I'm not a huge fan of uh, of on death abilities, as I have, have said, or um, on the negative effects. Um, but you know, as you've said, that's kind of a thing that all Titan Legios are gonna be affected by. So you know, they're a good all rounder because their bonuses can are gonna happen no matter what play style you play. Right, you know, lose Titans no matter if you run a Ferox or a Mandatum or, you know, you're going to be losing Titans. So yeah, there is a uh, use for their rules every game. Unless you're very lucky and nobody kills yeah. you. And in that case, then what are you, what are you complaining about, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'll happily keep all of my Titans on the board. Unless it's yeah. one of those games where like you've, um, you're trying to kill each other, but mm. both of you are failing. <laughs> yeah. Those, <laughs> those very fr- <laughs> frustrating. But yeah. Uh, let us know what your thoughts are in the comments. Like, have you played Legio Tempestus? Um, do you have one yourself? Have you come across them? Would you play them as loyalists or do you play them as um, as traitor? I'm always interested to uh, to hear what you guys got to say. Um, and with that done, Johnny, I think it's time for us to take a very short break and uh, yeah. we'll come back and we'll talk chill out hobby shenanigans and uh, a couple of events that we've got uh, in the pipeline. Hell yeah. Welcome back, Johnny. We are all stretched. We've done our lunges, uh, mm-hmm. ready to close out the the podcast with uh, our latest news and and updates. What yeah. have you been up to over, over over Christmas? I mean, obviously, like we've been really busy with all of that. Have you managed to get any hobby in while you've been? Um, um yeah, busy yeah, packing and wrapping. Yeah, it's been a bit of a busy few weeks, hasn't it? Um, got a little bit of hobby done, a bit of event plan- planning done as well. Um. Mostly though, uh, non legions slash adeptus titanicus. Although I have started corrupting uh, one of the warhounds from the li box for my uh, for my new Volper list that I'm going to run that isn't complete a complete meme. Uh, there will still be melee reavers in there, but we're also going to have some nasty little uh, warhounds. It's so, a like, cool corruption um, where like the the faceplate of the warhound is like splitting open. And a big eyeball is emerging from it, and I'm going to do the nice. eyeball all, you know, Resident Evilly, like the uh, like the other ones are done. Um, so yeah, gonna have it like it scanning and searching the streets almost as this like horrible corrupted monster. God, I love Traitor Titans. <laughs> Give me some green stuff and a lot of paint, and I'm I'm happy. It didn't take you long, did it, to come crawling mm-hmm. back to Volpa? I know. I just yeah, I don't know with those uh, Melter. Uh, uh, inside the melter pattern gun thingies. Um, I feel like they could be quite a lot of fun. Um, we'll see how it goes either way. But yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I've been um, desperately trying to kind of get my um, my Legion's Imperialis Imperial Fists done. And um, I think one of the mistakes maybe that I made maybe not mistakes, but I can't paint them on the actual base. So I've been, I've been painting them in uh, on little cocktail sticks. So put them in cocktail sticks and then, you know, you you can paint them on the sprue, but I I find this personally a little bit easier. Um, But because of that, you end up without having any units to play with because like they're stuck on cocktail sticks until they're actually painted. So I've been trying to get through as quickly as possible with, with, with them. There's just so much infantry to paint like, and it's okay. That's 30 points. Awesome. Okay. That took me two hours. I'm sure I'm, I'm taking far too long to paint them, but uh, I, I can't quite get fully past the perfectionist in me to make them look as good as I possibly can at this scale. I feel the pain. I think we have to embrace the suck and just, just, yeah. just get on with it. Just do it, you know. Um, yeah. I think, we're just yeah. I feel like my marine quality level is going to go real quick. Um, hey, you know, when I worked at G- GW, they said faces and bases. Mm-hmm. So I think we've both focused a lot of effort on making the bases look decent. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously at that scale, you can't really see much in the way of the detail of the model and i'm quite pleased how they're coming together it's just coming together a bit slower than i would have liked and i with... think once they're all together you know all all on you know on a board together those individual 
marines you're not going to be you know picking them up and yeah. inspecting them um just they'll look good as a piece of force yeah i was just hoping to have more done I, we've we've got an a we've got our learn to play event at employment on the 13th of january which is in two weeks time so that is my goal is to get um we're doing 1750 because frankly there's not enough out there to really be looking at larger games at this point in time um but my goal is to get all of the infantry done so i can get them onto their bases and then it doesn't really matter if my um tanks aren't painted because they are physical standalone they're all you know glued together so it'll be fine mm. uh, and i can use titans from my other legios um rather than the new ones um as an example but um i am really enjoying painting them it's just very very different and the um perfectionist in me is struggling a little bit but um yeah it's um the contrast is going a long way um contrast works really really well and uh mm. yeah I'm i've already those. got plans for the next legio nice we you going legion i should say um oh, I so say, yeah. um i think what i'm going to do is i am going to do a, a formation of um white scars as as I talked about last year, I found a way to paint white scars at this scale you know, pretty well, and I am, that I'm happy with. Um, and I've got the Xiphons, the three Xiphons, and the um, Thunderhawk already painted up. So I'm thinking I will do an aerial assault um, formation. Oh yeah, with those guys, mm-hmm. um, like just as kind of like a, a little mini formation to mm-hmm. kind of go on the side, and then then the imperial fist will be the main one and then you know when jet bikes come out and all that sort of stuff i'll add those to the um the white scars instead um but yeah the, the it's the lack of uh, legions releases has been the big problem at the moment i know obviously stuff has slowed down with christmas and stuff but they haven't i think they've just started to restock some of the legion stuff um mm. but they've um you know they want three thousand points and they've just put up an event, um, 70 quid for two days at Warhammer World on the, when is it again? Um, oh, I had it, it was in, um, it's in April. I can't remember mm. the exact date in April. Um, and I really kind of quite fancied going to that. And, you know, I might, I know I can't because I've got a gig with my band on that night, so I can't go. Um, but, um, you know they want three thousand points, and that's only four months away, unless they really step up Start releasing their stuff releases. Soon. Mm. Which I'm not sure if I'm going if I can see that happening because they've just announced the old world dropping next weekend. So, you know that's going to take up quite a bit of their time. It's on the um, uh, 27th and 28th of April, so you know quite far into April, so nearly five months, but. Um, there's so much on their release schedule that they've announced back in April, August that they've not got out yet. We've got no new direwolves. We've got no none of the um, what they call like this the siege dreadnoughts and mm-hmm. uh, tarantulas and tons of solar auxilia stuff. The um, land raiders, Spartans. Um, we don't even have like boxes of Lehman Russ or Malkadors or Sakarans or Predators, like they're all still kind of waiting in the wings. So unless they can get start getting some of this stock out soon, um, it's going to be tricky to get a 3,000-point list that's going to be interesting and is not yeah. just going to be a load Two of boxes tactical marines. Smashed together. <laughs> yeah, which doesn't feel right no. um, to me. So I hope that they can sort that out. But altogether, you know, altogether I'm, I'm, I am enjoying um, Legion Superior. I'm looking forward to getting like three or four games in on the 13th of January at Entoyment. Uh, tickets are up for sale on Entoyment's website for those, and we'll probably leave a link in the description as well um, if you do want to attend. It's um, it's it's purely a – it says it's learn to play. It's not going to be a tutorial session as such. It's just about getting people into a room together, setting up some nice tables and playing games um, as a community. Uh, and as such, the price of the tickets is, is cheap to uh, – basically just pay our overheads and that's about it um but it's it should be quite good hoping for like you know a dozen people or so might show up to that and play some games and learn off each other and learn together um after that we've got beachheads um which we need to kind of crack on with um get ready um, 
I need to paint up some terrain for that. Are you have you adding any of your terrain to that as well? I will. We will have to with uh, all the <laughs> excited uh, people um, signing up. Um, uh, it's always a good way to get your backlog of terrain done. Mm. <laughs> Just that little bit of pressure to get it done for Beachhead, and then like we'll have tons for like the channel and stuff, which will be quite mm. good. Um, and that'll be great. That's the largest ever um, UK based um, AT tournament. Um, last year was 54. I think we're up to 60 or something now. I can't, can't remember exactly. Um, but yeah, it's going to be great. Really good fun. And, um, the Titanicus community is always awesome. Um, there is a few teams which have expressed that they've had maybe one dropout or something. I, they may have filled them already, but if you were looking to join Beachhead, but didn't have a team, um, or the tickets had sold out, jump on our Discord into the Beachhead 2024 channel and you can ask if anybody has got any gaps in their teams or if they need any backups or we can add you to a reserve list. And, um, yeah, let, just just let us know. Um, last year, we only had three people drop out and we knew about that two months in advance and they were the only people who didn't turn up, like everybody else attended. So it's always a really well-attended um, mm. event. But obviously spaces are tight so um if you do want to attend just let just jump onto the discord and, and ask about if people got anybody any spaces and then you're doing something as well aren't you yes yes so uh what are we looking at now possibly april time um, early april early april uh good we... tester actually if you are planning on going up to uh the old warhammer world uh, mm. event and you want to get in a few games of practice before then absolutely yeah so um we are looking at running a narrative uh, Legions Imperialis event, um, which is always hella exciting. Um, I have been our first narrative event, our first well. ever narrative event. Yeah, um, I love this sort of stuff. Uh, <laughs> as a as a dungeon master for of a long time, you know, writing lore and um, you know making some cool interconnected stuff is uh, is my jam. So I've been having really good fun with that. Um, I think the the design philosophy at the moment is stick as close to the the book rules as possible in terms of missions, um, and you know because people are new still to the game. I think we all are. Uh, even you know people that will be toing will still be relatively new to the game. Um, so we don't want to stray too far from the the rules that are in the book, the the missions in the book. Um, but we may might want to add a couple of uh, variables to each mission just to add a, a nice narrative effect. Yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be good fun. Um, possibly look at some, you know, um, winning and losing bonuses for, um, for the factions, the sides, traitor and loyalist. Um, depending and on and who this wins is going to be, round. this is going to be a specific legions imperialis event. Yes. It will not be a, a linked one with, uh, AT. Um, although that we may be in talks of doing a, uh, a linked, Li at event at some point in the future. Um, I think this will be our kind of um, uh, our test run of that um, with uh, with narrative event. And if that works out nicely, we can, you know, yeah, maybe have some linked narrative stuff uh, in the uh, between the two games in the future, which I think would be really sick. Um, I think we were talking about you know having effects uh, from winning one. Uh, one game affecting the other game and vice versa. Um, so you've got the the macro scale play um, uh, with uh, with AT and then the kind of the you know more uh, elite forces in Legions Imperialis, which is funny to see you know to say considering it's armies of them. But you know, uh, so yeah, you know, I think it's going to be really good fun. I've got some. Um, uh, some test pages and stuff done already that are looking really nice. Um, yeah. Can't yeah, wait. I'm definitely going to be nicking those templates just for any event pack mm. that we put out because it's just nice, just really nice to look at and feels a bit more premium than just a page of A4 made up in Word. Mm. So well done on that respect. Thank so you. It's really, well, really good. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get it out to everyone um, as soon as uh, as soon as we're happy with it and yeah. um, a couple of weeks maybe before the event or something. And um, if you followed our writing competition and uh, our law video on the Legio Maximal, mm -hmm. intense, 
Um, this is going to take place in that same kind of little sector of space that we've started developing is like the channel channel law, so mm-hmm. to speak. Uh, so it was Ed, wasn't it, that, that won the yeah. writing competition, Ed Ralph? Um, so uh, a lot of the law for this, uh, because it is taking place in the Corsair cr- cluster, which was the uh, which was Ed's idea for the uh, the backstory of Lee J Maximal, um, we're going to actually uh, have it take place in that cluster. So um, I've been diligently reading and rereading uh, Ed's Ed's contribution, um, and it is uh, is sick. And there's a load of uh, cool little uh, things I'm adding in from there to to even affect the the games of Legions Imperialis. So. Yeah, it's gonna be gonna be real cool. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, just just something different, and I think after we went to Greetings from the Warp, it did kind mm. of scratched a different itch, didn't it? Because there's not quite the same sort of level of competitiveness as I like a bit of competition and stuff, but mm. you know, it's usually a bit more chilled out. And I think until we've really got you know our feet firmly on the ground with Legions Imperialis, like it's um, it's tricky to kind of know how to make it competitive. Um, so, you know, like I say, just sort of finding our feet. And I think keeping it Legion's specific, we'll have had Beachhead only two months earlier, which will have been a solely AT event. So this one will be solely allied event um, based as well. And maybe we'll get another event out at some point during the rest of the year as well while we prep up for Beachhead, um, which we might try and do both at Beachhead. 2025 possibly possibly <laughs> possibly Legion, legions and uh at uh two separate events probably the body is weak but the spirit is willing <laughs> absolutely <laughs> um, yeah that would be a bit of a nightmare for for tables but i think we could do it with uh with all of the support we've gotten from people um on the yeah we, front. We, I, we, we, the thing is is like if we continue to get the terrain that we have been getting together mm-hmm. um if we still get the same support with um from the community with tables for AT then you know we there's no reason why we couldn't persist AT at the same scale that we've done this year and also add a probably slightly smaller but still you know not inconsequential amount of uh, of ally as well mm-hmm. so exciting times we w- we wanted to do it this year didn't we but as soon as they pushed it back from August, it was just not really possible for not us to kind of mobilise no, it. Um, I think just before we um, wrap up the show for today, um, I just want to say a, a thank you to Kablams. Um, he uh, sent us some of his plastic um, terrain alternatives. He makes um, ruins and other buildings out of the Plasticard Styrene, and he's currently selling them on his website as well it's it's a very nice alternative to kind of the more traditional sprue plastic um or mdf like i personally love the idea of mdf i hate working with mdf like the smell the dirt you know from the laser cutting and stuff is oh, disgusting. i love the smell but the dirt is a nightmare yeah no i just every time i my room smells like a barbecue for about the next <laughs> oh yeah of, why don't you want that what? <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah i just want to say a big thank you to kablams for for sending us that stuff um we're going to get um some of that done i've been meaning to do it for a, a number of weeks but everything's just been so busy over christmas that um i'm hoping it'll be done and in and it'll have a little corner of the uh, uh our tables at uh at beachhead um but yeah, thank you very much. Um, and of course, that you know, do check out our other page, our patron, our other sponsors as well. If you are in the the market for terrain, like the GW Ruin sets in particular, are very very nice, but currently out of stock everywhere. So if you are looking for alternatives for ruined terrains, check out Kablams, but also um, check out our sponsors, um, Troublemaker Games. They've got some. I think currently they do one of the best um pound for pound plastic for money uh ruin sets uh on the market um so do check them out as well all of their links are going to be in our descriptions i think oh, that have you got anything else that you want to say johnny i think that we are coming to a natural close here i think the uh the hangover is is overtaking Kicking me at in. this point <laughs> um no, not at all. I'm just very excited to go back inside now and uh, and carry on probably writing some more um, event event stuff. Sounds good. Um, that's going to be good fun. We did have a, um, a request, actually, um, 
on our Patreon channel, um, I put up a, a post about what would people like to see in 2024 mm. for content from us and some ideas. So if you do have ideas of things that you want to see, ideally specific, and don't just spam Traitor Legion's ranked, <laughs> we, <laughs> we know we need to do that one. That's we very really much want on to our, do it too. It really it's, do. Just, it's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of It's a lot talking. of work. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of one of those things of like a significant amount of work for one episode or mm -hmm. like um, the same amount of work could do us two or three. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why we've not got around to it up until now. But, um, you know, do send us your ideas of stuff that you want to see, um, additional things, content, um, all that kind of stuff. Do let us know. Um, if you um, – oh, yeah, the, the one thing, the request, that's what we were talking about. Mm. Um, they want to see a POW – at the uh, the end of this uh, this episode. God no, I can't. I can't do it again. I don't know what what, what that was all about. <laughs> no, 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 you know what it was. It's because I thought you'd cut off the recording, so I was just like, okay, we're kid, bow, we're done, let's go. <laughs> um, and it was still recording. And then after that, it was also still recording. So when I was like going, ah, yeah, yes, it was. Yeah, and I, yeah the false ending to to the show, mm. uh, which I then turned into a Discord sticker um, <laughs> for you. Thank you. Um, to fully memeify <laughs> you. Um, but if you do want to be a patron, um, then you can check out our, our Patreon channel. Um, you get, um, at certain tiers, you can get 10% off Battle Bling orders, of which we also have an affiliate link. So every time you use our affiliate link to place orders on Battle Bling, we also get a very small kickback from Battle Bling. All, all helps. Um, but you can back us from as little as a pound. It all goes massively um, far towards our running costs and maintaining the website fees registrations discord um keeping our gear up to date so we can remain competitive in the market getting the newest and um you know best releases as as and when they're released because you know at the end of the day we're not made of money ourselves so we, we try and kind of keep up to date as best as we can but it all helps us kind of support the events and support the battle reports and all of that kind of stuff so those of you who do support us on patreon you are really the cornerstone of what keeps us going keeps us doing this thank you very very much and if you would like to continue uh, if you would like to start um supporting us as well you can do so um, on our patreon account for as little as a quid last but not least like and subscribe it is absolutely free for you to do so so please just hit that button hit that bell hit that like every time we get one of those it just helps raise us up in the old listings so uh um, and why wouldn't you want to get notifications about when the latest Maximal Fire videos are dropping? Because we're awesome. Exactly. No, that's Johnny's yeah. line, isn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, he copyrighted that as well, so you've got to be careful. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you announced that we had a we had an end-of-year Christmas party, didn't we? Oh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, yeah. That, that was quite, quite good fun. Mm -hmm. I ran a little quiz mm -hmm. um, for our Discord people. You and Johnny argued um, about the quiz for about half the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, this is the problem when you put two big egos in a, in a yeah. room and a, give them a stage. Oh, but, um, that was yeah. lovely. <laughs> Tw 20 pence uh, won it. He's one of our Discord members, and he got himself some Maximal Fire merch. And um, multiple people who joined also won some uh, vouchers hmm. to uh, Battle Bling to spend, uh, very generously provided by Johnny Core of, of Battle Bling Store. Um, that was good. Good way to end out the year. Oh, for um, sure. So, but yeah, all of these little things that we try and do for the community is um, um, is all kind of supported by you guys. So, thank you very much for doing that. Yeah. Um, we also kind of were quite humbled to find out that some people had put us forward for uh, the hobby uh, Warhammer Heroes. Heroes thing. Yeah, wow, that was um, weird. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we'd never expect to win anything like that because of how small we are. But like, mm. you know, if if you do enjoy what we do, please put us forwards. Uh, if it helps get us on GW's radar a little bit more, helps grow the channel, then that would be amazing. We can't think of, you know, we can't possibly kind of like fathom how much an impact just having our name kind of in a, you know, a published list somewhere, if it's a short list, mm. um, might do to help grow the channel. So if you want to give us your vote, and we'd be uh, most appreciated. A um, little bit embarrassing uh, finding that out, but at the same yeah. time, kind of quite nice and uh, and very humbling. I'm very yeah. humble. You are the most humble person very I've met. Very humble. You're yeah. so humble. <laughs> God, you're so humble, Alex. The humblest. Yeah. Look over his left shoulder or right. I don't know if it's going to be flipped. And you'll see his many awards that he's 
very uh very meticulously made sure that they are in camera view throughout the entire can you can you tell i've actually had a tidy up in here today like look i've got my my new i've got rid of my 3d printer and he flexes the the mortgage's worth of titans below (laughs) i've got i've got our our battle bling logo there for Mm -hmm. our sponsors uh my 3d printer has now been moved out of shot we've got my yeah my my loads of loads of reward awards yeah, top yeah. There. very nice yeah, yeah. show off yeah so humble, humble. Mm. all right johnny <laughs> are, you, are you gonna give us a proper pow come on okay i mean oh man it was a patron right yeah yeah i've got it right you know shout You've out got to. yeah yeah no, right. not that we are dancing monkeys <laughs> no but, you know, that, no but, although if you know <laughs> also <laughs> also we'll do anything we'll do guys. anything <laughs> <laughs> oh dear well go on then no it's at the end right oh you want to do it after the um the, the sign off okay well i can do it now but that's a little bit awkward so maybe we should wait it, it for was, the it, post it was sign a bit off aw- it was a bit awkward before right like, yeah i know I know. Okay. All right, guys. Thank you very much for joining us today. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the content. Please do click those buttons, and we'll see you again next time. And always remember to go big, go loud, and stay humble. Pow? <laughs>